So based on current research, I, and Informed Fitness in general, does not recommend the use of unstable services outside of a rehabilitative setting, physical therapy. Exercise performed on unstable services does not transfer well to stable services or our everyday life, nor do the risks outweigh the beneficial adaptation. Some experts even believe that there may be a reduction in stable service performance for the same exercise. When developing training programs for clients, fitness practitioners, they must focus solely on safe, intense strength training. That, of course, was New York Times best-selling author and founder of Informed Fitness, Adam Zickerman. I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network and a client of Informed Fitness. Shortly, we will be joined by Adam and his general manager and trainer of the Informed Fitness location right there in the heart of New York City, just about five or six blocks east of the base of Central Park. Here in episode 46, Adam and Mike discuss something that the vast majority of us take for granted every day, our balance. They will discuss some of the myths and facts regarding the maintenance of our ever so important balance through the myriad of training methods practiced in gyms all over the country, some of which are downright dangerous. So how do you safely train to improve your balance? Well, let's hear from the experts. So the thing about balance is that most of us take our balance for granted. I mean, I don't think any of us think twice about walking across a gravel driveway or transitioning from walking on a sidewalk onto grass or getting out of bed in the middle of the night without stumbling. I mean, it's just things that just we do. We don't think about it. And believe it or not, there are the people that have impaired balance. I mean, activities like I just mentioned can be extremely fatiguing, hard to do, and dangerous. I mean, falls. I mean, especially older individuals. And there's so much confusion about balance and what balance actually is and all the myriad factors that influence balance. And our esteemed, <laughs> our esteemed exercise industry, as usual, mm -hmm. oversimplifies the solution to improving one's balance, mainly because they don't even understand all the parameters of balance and all the things that go into somebody's balance. And of course, you know, as a result uh, of not understanding it and oversimplifying it, you know, uh, most of the recommended exercises to improve balance are at best ineffective and at worst, they can actually lead to more injury. So... The story about balance, it kind of reminds me of the same story about saturated fat. Absolutely. How it's still bad for you to have saturated fat. And the reason the balance and the saturated fat story kind of are similar to each other is because on the surface, it seems very logical that saturated fat must be bad for you, right? I mean, how could it not be? I mean, you can practically see the gobs of fat clogging your arteries as you eat it. But still, there is no compelling evidence backing this idea up yet. Despite the fact that there's no compelling evidence, researchers are still warning us against its consumption and skew the results actually to fit their argument. And we talked about that in depth uh, in, in, in podcast. Which one, Tim? It was episode 34 titled, Is the American Heart Association Misleading Us About Coconut Oil? So we go certainly deeper into it about some of the studies and how some of those studies are <laughs> incredibly outdated, which are telling exactly. us the saturated fats are, are harmful for us. So, you know, th that's another example of this idea that it must be true because how can saturated fat not be bad for you? And we, we try to support our beliefs, our biases. And the same thing with balance. You see, there's a growing trend in our fitness industry now, and it's the use of these unstable services during resistance training. You know, if you walk through any local gym, a personal training studio in the functional training gyms, you'll see Bozu domes, air discs, balance boards. And some professionals, a lot of professionals actually, are claiming that unstable surfaces uh, increased balance, uh, proprioception, which is the ability for the body to know where it is and how it is moving in space, and of course, core stability. All right. Well, at first glance, as with the saturated fat story, at first glance, uh, it's easy to see why most of the population would believe such claims. I mean, if you balance on an unstable surface, why wouldn't you be able to balance better on a stable surface? Right. If your core is constantly contracting to maintain your center of mass, why wouldn't your core stability improve? And while these claims seem logical, the truth of the matter is current research has not been able to support any of this. So first things first, let's define balance as it's truly defined in the medical world. So simply put, balance is the ability to maintain the body's center of gravity over its base of support. And a properly functioning balance system allows us to do four things, really. Mm -hmm. All right. First, it allows us to see clearly while we're moving our vision. All right. It also balance uh, allows us to identify 
orientation with respect to gravity. Three, it determines direction and speed of movement. And then with those three abilities, it also helps us make automatic postural adjustments to maintain posture and stability in various conditions and activities. Now, balance is achieved and maintained by a complex, a, a very complex set of sensory motor control systems. And that includes sensory input from several sources, our sight, our touch, which is called proprioception, and something called the vestibular apparatus within the ears, mm -hmm. our inner ear. And that stimuli input from motion, equilibrium, spatial orientation. So already you can see this is kind of complicated stuff. And there are, there are disciplines and just this balance alone. I mean, ear, nose, and throat doctors deal with this regular basis. Ophthalmologists deal with this on a regular basis. Neurologists deal with people with balance problems on a regular basis because that's what balance is, is part of. It's part of our neural system, our visual system, and our inner ear. All these things contribute to our balance. Then it's the integration of all the sensory input and then the motor output to the eye and skeletal muscles that react to the sensory input. And all along this chain, things can go wrong and affect our balance. Injury, disease, certain drugs, and even just the aging process can affect one or more of these components. In addition to all this, there are also psychological factors that impair our sense of balance. If you've fallen in the past and got hurt, now you're nervous. You know, there's all kinds of psychological things that make us think that we don't have balance or affects our balance, even though really there's nothing wrong with those sensory uh, systems that I just mentioned. So I just want to briefly touch upon, no pun intended, <laughs> some of the sensory <laughs> input. Uh, I'll try not to get too bogged down in the biology, but this stuff is really fascinating. So you have the input from muscles and joints, all right? So this is called proprioceptive information from the skin, the muscles, and the joints. And they involve sensory receptors that are sensitive to stretch or pressure in the surrounding tissues. For example, increased pressure is felt in the front part of the soles of the feet when a standing person leans forward. With any movement of the legs, arms, and other body parts, sensory receptors respond by sending impulses to the brain. Now, along with other information, this, these stretch and pressure cues help our brain determine where our body is in space. So that's the input from muscles and joints. But you also have input from what I mentioned before, the vestibular system. Sensory information about motion, equilibrium, and spatial orientation is provided by this vestibular apparatus, they call it, which in each ear includes something called the utricle, the saccule, and these, these three semicircular canals. You might remember this from high school biology. <laughs> anyway, the utricle and the saccule, they detect gravity and linear movement. And the three semicircular canals, well, they detect rotational movement and are located at right angles to each other and are filled with this fluid. Right? I think it's called endolymph, this fluid, if I'm not mistaken. Regardless, the head rotates in a direction and it's sensed by these canals. This fluid moves in a very specific way and exerts pressure against the canal's uh, sensory receptor. It's this whole chain of events and the receptor then sends impulses to the brain about the movement and the muscles react accordingly. Now, if you have an inner ear problem, balance can be completely affected. And there's nothing a trainer can do about that is, is where my point is going. So we also have this input from the eyes. Our vision has a lot to do with our balance. You know, the eyes have these sensory receptors uh, in the retina. They're called rods and cones. And they send impulses to the brain that provide visual cues, identifying how a person is oriented uh, relative to other objects. So if you have vision problems or blurred vision or peripheral vision problems, that can screw up your balance. And then all these inputs from the eyes, uh, touch, proprioception, from our ears, the vestibular apparatus, all these sensory inputs, then they have to all get integrated. And that's a whole system. And if there's anything wrong with the integration system, then balance can be affected. So as you can see, the human balance system involves a complex set of sensory motor control systems. And malfunction or damage to any of these components, either through injury or disease, can lead to all kinds of balance problems. With all this in mind, doesn't it seem rather primitive to think that people's balance issues can be solved by working out on unstable surfaces <laughs> or using free weights versus machines? <laughs> mm. As Dr. McGuff once said, and I, I don't think this is his quote, but I like it. He said that um, if all you have is a hammer, then the whole world looks like a nail. Trainers are not ENTs. Trainers are not neurologists. Trainers are not ophthalmologists. So when a client comes in and mentions that they're having trouble with their balance, what does a trainer do? They turn to the tool that they have, the hammer that they have, all right, the unstable services. And 
knowing all this, if you really know about balance issues, this is so primitive, it, 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 it's mind boggling. So let's start exploring the exercise industry's claims of increased balance. Now that we know what balance consists of, there are few, if any, actual studies to date that show that the type of increased balance and core stability developed through exercises performed on unstable surfaces transfers to stable surfaces. Therefore, while performing exercise on unstable surfaces, while that may increase an individual's ability to perform the exercises on that particular surface, it doesn't transfer to the stable surfaces, grass, the court, or even ice. Now, optimal balance is gained by performing a given task on the service on which it will be performed in everyday life. Matter of fact, many researchers also believe that performing exercises or sports skills on unstable surfaces actually decrease the ability to perform the same tasks on a stable surface. Now, I think the reason of this decrease is because it, it, according to well-established motor learning principles, the movement pattern on an unstable surface interferes with the original pattern created on a stable surface. As far as the body is concerned, doing a similar exercise on a stable surface versus an unstable surface, they might as well be two completely different things, although we think it's similar enough to kind of mimic, but it doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't transfer. They call it negative transfer. In other words, the unstable surface is not specific to the movement being practiced. The time spent on an unstable surface could have been better spent just mastering the movement itself that you're trying to improve. Another popular claim made by proponents of unstable surface training is an increase in what they call your core stabilization. As with balance, any core stabilization that is possibly enhanced by activity on an unstable surface, again, has not been shown to transfer to stable surfaces. Again, most research even shows that performing resistance exercises on stable surfaces requires more core activation and stabilization than performing the same exercise on an unstable surface. Again, most likely because the ability to provide progressive overload, which means that's what exercise is, progressive overload, meaning gradual increases in weight. As you get stronger, you're progressively increasing the weight. And because you're on unstable surfaces, you really can't keep raising the weight when you're on on an unstable surface. As the individual gets stronger, it becomes too risky to increase the weight while on unstable surfaces, which is probably why those findings were what they are. So based on current research, I, and informed fitness in general, does not recommend the use of unstable surfaces outside of a rehabilitative setting, physical therapy. Exercise performed on unstable surfaces does not transfer well to stable surfaces or our everyday life, nor do the risks outweigh the beneficial adaptation. Some experts even believe that there may be a reduction in stable service performance for the same exercise. When developing training programs for clients, fitness practitioners, they must focus solely on safe, intense strength training. And if you want to get better at a particular activity, practice that activity. I have a client, for example, that, well, she has trouble walking. She's very weak. She had a fall. She got sick. She gained a lot of weight. Now she has trouble walking. What should I do? I say, let's do leg press. Let's get those legs strong. Let's get strong overall. And you know what? Start walking. If it's hard to walk for two blocks, walk one and a half blocks and then keep increasing it till you can walk two blocks, then three blocks and four blocks. Well, guess what? She can walk now. She's walking five, six blocks without a problem anymore. And all she's been doing is doing leg press and all the gross motor skills of developing gross motor strength. And she's walking. As another example of some of the hogwash, some of the some of the crazy stuff that's out there is, uh, there's these ideas that if you start practicing walking backwards, that it will help you uh, walk forward. Again, the only thing that practicing walking backward does for you is teach you how to better walk backwards. <laughs> it does nothing. It's a completely different motor skill. That's like saying learning how to play the guitar is going to help you play the flute. There might as well be two different instruments, completely two different instruments. And this is going on all over the place. And you know what? If some of this stuff was just benign and it really didn't do much for you, I don't know if I'd be making such a big deal about this. Because, you know, the bottom line is these, these pra- a lot of these practices are not benign. My good friend, Bill Simone just told me he came back from a functional training seminar just to see what they're teaching. And, and they're having you do like squats on one leg with, with weight on just one side of a barbell over your shoulders just to, just to kind of strengthen your core. 
So as you know, guys, in addition to the Inbound Podcasting Network, I run a video production marketing company, and one of my clients is an agency that hires my company to go out and film other gyms, of course, that aren't in form fitness and practice some of these weird and crazy uh, modalities. (laughs) And I literally filmed this woman standing on this ball that looked like Saturn. I'm sure that's what you're talking about. And while she was standing on this ball, this blue ball with this wooden outside that she was standing on platform, she was doing curls. And uh, first thing, and she was doing those curls and it was next to some machines. And I thought, well, if she falls, she's going to hit her head. And Mm -hmm. so I was thinking that 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 must be what you're talking about. Some of these other uh, facilities uh, offering some of these, you know, like you mentioned, Bill D. Simone uh, was just came back from a conference to see what they're teaching nowadays. Some of these crazy exercises that, that some of these trainers are having their, their clients go through that would cause more harm than good. I mean, that's a disaster waiting for happen. I mean, you get hurt doing that. You're not just pulling a muscle. You can have a spinal injury that can set you back for the rest of your life. So these are not benign practices that are going on. They're telling sedentary middle-aged people to stabilize on these balls with one leg, and they're damaging and getting ACL tears and all kinds of crazy knee problems as a result of just trying to improve their balance, as if they even know what balance actually is and what it consists of. So unless your goal is to perform in a circus... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or balance on top of a ball, don't waste your time training on these unstable services. I, I actually work with people on their balance and try them in, in a similar fashion to what Adam explained. I try to explain to them what's involved with it. And I think uh, he made a big, a very big point, especially with like the vision and the vestibular elements of it. Uh, I mean, if, if you have problems with that, it's nothing we could do training wise, you know, <laughs> to help those issues, which are part of maintains your center of gravity. But the tone of this is that outside of strength training, there's nothing you could do to help your balance outside of the actual motor skill of whatever this this specific activity is and just strength training. And there's nothing else that we could be doing for helping our, our, our balance. Nope. I really don't think there is absolutely anything you can do as trainers. We are trainers, right? So, so the best thing we can do for our balance as trainers is strength. I mean, a good portion of people that have balance problems are just weak. It's weakness. It's low muscle tone. So just strengthen their quads, but you don't have to strengthen their quads on an unstable surface. It's the idea. It's the idea of unstable surfaces having some additional benefit for somebody's balance than just doing a leg extension, just doing a push-up, just doing a classic exercise that's congruent to our biomechanics. It's going to strengthen every muscle in your body. And then if you're having issues with your balance, walking, or you know you went on a boat ride and you're falling all over the boat, uh, then you know what? Go on the boat more often because the more you go on a boat, the better your balance is going to get as long as you're strong enough. If, now, if you're really weak, if you have really weak legs, you know, you're going to have balance problems on a stable surface, much less an unstable surface. But learning how to stand on a boat, if you're strong enough, can only be improved by standing on a boat. And this woman that I was telling you about, I mean, forget about things as complicated as that. These older people who have had injuries and they got really weak and they have trouble walking. So now you're telling this person to stand on one leg, which, which has potential issues, as if that's going to help. Being able to stand on one leg is not going to help them walk. It's going to help them learn how to stand on one leg. Now, unless they want to be a crane in Florida, <laughs> they don't have to do that to improve their walking. They just have to improve their quad strength to improve their walking and then walk, perform the skill that you want to get better at with your additional strength. Well, if, there, if there's limitations and even in the simple act of walking, in the simple act of walking, like, like just say like an elderly person who shuffles right. oftentimes and, right. and obviously you're absolutely right. If your quads and your hip flexors are strong, then you're going to lift your leg a little bit right. higher. So therefore you won't be shuffling so much. Like I, I, while you were talking, kind of sort of alluded to where I was going a little bit when I was like thinking, is there a difference between an unstable, because I agree with the the balance board, creating an unstable situation, not an unstable surface, but an unstable situation on its, and, and I'm thinking in its fundamental sense, we're to, and we're going into a, a, the common thing is balance for walking or balance for getting up or something like that, uh, finding your center of gravity. Let's just talk about walking in it. Fundamentally, you're switching from one leg to the next leg to the next leg, to the next leg. And that is a skill. It's a motor skill. It's a, that, and it's right. and a way to practice fashion. that skill if it's walking, then walk. 
There's nothing you can do other than walking to perfectly improve that skill. But if you're, but if you're having difficulty with that already, fundamentally, if you're already, and, and the thing is, I don't do anything on an unstable surface, but I create an unstable situation so they can have awareness of what it feels like to be on one leg and all of the muscles that do fire, which proprioceptively, unconsciously, which guide you to shift your body slightly to in each direction. If you stand on one leg, you feel right. so all, you, everything's everything's firing I a get, little bit. I get what you're saying. In, and, in an involuntary way yes. to sort of give you a little bit of awareness now. And the thing is, I guess what I'm leading to, I haven't done the full research, although I have seen studies that exist, that there are ways to train to improve those proprioceptive that that firing so mm -hmm. you could actually maintain your uh uh like even if it's just standing on one leg i mean which is inevitably a fundamental piece of it's happening very slowly or rather quickly in the process of walking the skill believe it or not then this is this is the, the big misconception that people have they underestimate the power of modal learning and even standing on one leg even the act of knowing learning how to stand on one leg doesn't prepare you for the action of walking because they're two different motor skills. The only thing that standing on one leg does for you in, is, is teach you how to walk on or stand on one leg. You're, again, you're much better off strengthening the legs and then learning how to walk. Now, if it is such a problem for somebody to walk where you have to start breaking it down to the elements that you're talking about, they've already disqualified themselves from working out with us as a trainer. Now it starts getting into they need to work with an occupational therapist if it's that hard for them. They have to work with a neurologist possibly and really get down to why it is so absolute. If their strength is fine, then, then, you, then that's what I was talking about, all these other things that go into balance. There's got to be some other issue. I think, uh, I think there may be other issues. Uh, I think, and part of them are psychological. Uh, and and, and well, I mean, well, but now you're is, talking about. But I'm talking about like, but the thing is, I think sometimes going back to progression, okay, being walking, say, progression level 10, and now we have a person who has no confidence in the ability to walk because they had a knee surgery and they're 68 years old or something like that. Right. And that's why they and, go to the occupational therapy and they and they work on that with them. And then when they're ready through occupational therapy, they come to us and we finish the process by getting them as strong as shit, right. safely. Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> the thing is, what I was talking but, about but is you did say it's something confidence, about, I think, is part of ah, what goes ah, is, now, now, now we're getting on something that we're going to agree on. Because I mentioned earlier that there's a psychological benefit, there's a psychological component of, of balance. All right. Now, if some of these, there are some benign things we can do. Planks, bird dogs, you know, those, those also help not so much with balance, but they help with the small rotor, uh, stabilized muscles of the spine, the rotary muscle of the spine, the, mul the multifidus, you know. So it's not so much the bird dogs and the planks that I have the problems with. It's really the unstable surfaces. Even standing on a leg, even though I don't think it's going to help them walk from a motor skill point of view, standing on one leg and learning how to balance like that or doing a one-legged lunge safely, you know, and slowly and controlled with a TRX strap possibly. I, I'm not, I'm not going to dismiss that completely out of hand because if somebody learns to do that and they feel confident doing that, that confidence can kind of teach them to do other things. It gives them the confidence to do other things. So even though it's not going to actually help them walk per se, if that's what their problem is, it's going to give them the confidence to try walking because they're doing these things now. Like, wow, look at me. I can stand on one leg now. I was never able to stand one leg. You know, and that confidence goes a long way. It's almost like a placebo effect. You know, so so I don't. There, so therefore, some if it's not something like a dangerous exercise, yeah. and it, it is standing out. That's kind of where I'm leading into a little bit. Is a the confidence part. Uh, the other part which is, is, which, is which, which can be huge, by which, the way. Which I haven't. I, I've seen studies that exist, but I haven't really gotten to be able to do the deep dive into them. That are sort of showing that there are connections between proprioception and motor learning. If practiced if practiced and it starts with various things like and even things but, that but you were they, talking but about i don't like, think they're saying it transfers to other activities just for that particular activity again you have i have no problem perhaps, perhaps not perhaps right. so not, anyway yeah. so so uh my ultimate point is not to not to bash you know occupational therapy and some of the modalities they use for people that have injuries and all kinds of stuff is that but but we have to be we have to be very careful not to pretend that we're neurologists or ents 
and understand what our limitations are as trainers. And, and we do something really good. We get people strong. And that goes a long way to helping somebody with their balance issues. And that might be just what they need, most people. Like, remember Tess Nakamura? She used to, we had this old client that always used a walking stick for confidence. And we got her really strong by doing I – was, I wasn't doing anything other than leg press with this woman. Right? And she worked out really hard. As time went on, she was – she felt she didn't even need a walking stick, although she carried it just in case. She, she felt a lot more stable on her feet. And I wasn't doing any of this crazy, unstable surface and stuff. I was just giving her strength and maybe even the confidence of, of walking again. Uh, so so that's, that's our sweet spot. That's what we do best. We get people strong and we get them strong without undermining their health and we make it really safe. And we don't play around with things that uh, waste time and that don't transfer to really skills. And again, if there's something that you want to do like planks and standing on a leg or, or doing some of these things that are relatively benign and really can't hurt you. And it helps build their confidence. I'm for it. I'm for it. But let's, let's not get carried away with it. And, and I'm not talking about the things that I see you do with your clients and that I even do sometimes with clients to help build that confidence and give them awareness of one side, you know, having one side of their glutes fire versus another side and things like that. Those are all confidence builders. It kind of makes them in touch with their body. And those are all good. But, but that's not balance to me. That, that's mind-body connection that are, opposite, are different from balance. That, you know, so the reason why I'm bringing it up is because I think what you just said is how people get it confused. I think they're thinking balance. Right. But really, it is oftentimes it is a mind-body connection that, that sometimes isn't patterned correctly. You know, like sometimes you, you either you're leaving something out uh, which is not letting you uh, do something that you're trying to do or, uh, yeah. or, or, and you even said yeah. it before you said like, and of course there's a chain of things that are going on early on and something could be broken in the chain. And, and as trainers, I, uh, obviously the strength element is, is the, is the big part of the whole thing, but it is, but, but it can also be a new medication. You know, the thing is there's a, there's a very strong motor learning principle that's being ignored out there. And I just want people to be buyer beware when it comes to doing all these crazy things on unstable services as if it's really going to do a better job for strengthening their core or do a better job of them going on a weekend trip on a boat and they think they're going to do better on the boat because they've been working on unstable services. And that's really the big point, especially the point where people are lifting weights and doing all these kind of dangerous moves on unstable services as if it's going to help them on the athletic field or the tennis court. That, that's unfortunate. Yeah, what, and, what was and, described and, before? What was described? I mean, like I, <laughs> that is horrible. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the big point. Let's not get, let's not get fooled uh, with this stuff. Thanks, guys. Hey, if you are new to the podcast and are just now learning about slow motion, high intensity strength training, and you want to try it for yourself, simply click the link in the show notes to the Inform Fitness website. Once you're there, click the Try Us Free button right there on their homepage, fill out the form, pick your location, and improve more than just your balance with a slow motion, high intensity, full body workout in just 20 minutes for free. You'll feel great, I promise. And if you're not near one of their several locations across the United States, Adam has a book titled Power of 10, the once a week slow motion fitness revolution. Pick it up today at a bookstore near you or to make it simple, it's just a click away and available at Amazon. That link will also be in the show notes. For less than about 15 bucks, you'll find some nutritional tips and a handy list of foods that support the Power of 10 protocol and some effective exercise demonstrations that you can perform in the comfort of your own home. Many great episodes on the way in the coming weeks, so please hit that subscribe button from whichever podcast app you might be listening. We have close to 50 episodes for you to binge listen, and if you don't mind, we'd appreciate it if you took some time to leave us a review. Until next time, for Adam Zickerman and Mike Rogers of Inform Fitness, I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network.